In First Peter chapter one, First Peter, Second Peter chapter one. There we go. I want to begin reading at verse one, where it says, "Simon Peter, a bond servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ." Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Now, um, there's, there's a lot right there at the beginning. But he, he says, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours. That's kind of a wow moment. You just pause for a moment and think, hello, this is Peter. This is Peter who said to the guy sitting at the temple, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give I to you. Rise and walk. The guy's on his feet. Th- this is Peter who found himself uh, praying. This, this girl, Tabitha, has died. He's praying she's raised to life. He says, faith of the same kind as ours. That's a pretty remarkable thing to say to somebody like me when you're somebody like Peter. But that's precisely what he's done here. He says, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours. The point being that believing is believing. Once you start believing, you're on that path. If I believe that God the Father raised Jesus from the dead, if I believe that He is both Lord and Christ to me, if I really believe those things, not just kind of think they might be interesting or they somehow salve some of my religious needs, but if I really believe those things, then I just move myself into the category with all those who have faith of that variety. And, and there aren't grades, junior believer, advanced believer, super-duper believer. There's, as, as I frequently say, there's the saints and the ain'ts. That's what there is. We either believe or we don't. And if we believe, then we have a faith of the same variety as Peter, Paul, John, Matthew. Hello? A, the same variety as, as all these guys. The same variety, the same type of believing that they were engaged in is what we're engaged in. And concerning that faith, down here at the end of the chapter, in chapter 1, Peter says very plainly, beginning of verse 16, he said, We did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such as an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased, we are ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. What's he talking about? He's talking about that moment that sometimes gets referred to in the marginal references in Bibles as the the Mount of Transfiguration. He's talking about that time when Jesus went apart with Peter and James and John and was talking to his heavenly father on the mountain and and they heard the voice from heaven. That's the moment when Peter said, maybe we should build altars here and tabernacle here. We should stay here. We should never leave this place. Have you ever been some Somewhere where you just had such a great time, you thought we, this should never end. You ever been in a moment like that? You ever been in a song service where it was just like this? Oh man, I don't ever want to be anywhere else. And you just have that moment. But you know, those things are are as good as those are. We have somewhere to go and something to do. And, and we're not just supposed to say stay cloistered together, forget the rest of the world. This is good. I'm happy. There's, there's something to be done out there. We have serving to do, yes? But, um, so that's the moment he's describing. And he's saying, listen, when we came to you, we didn't have a slick presentation. What we had was testimony of what we had seen. We, d- we didn't bring you. It wasn't, it wasn't the nifty. It wasn't how well we did with our PowerPoints. Those slides were awesome. We searched the Internet for hours to find those images, perfectly illustrating each point. And we got the points to rhyme and alliterate. It was great. Nothing wrong with everything we do to help make things 
easier to understand, easier to grasp. That's all good. But he says, listen, that wasn't what grasped you. That wasn't what got your attention. It wasn't how slick our presentation was, how clever our tales were, how beautifully we illustrated things, how nicely we presented it all. He said it's what the content got your attention. It was eyewitness reports. We weren't talking about a God we'd heard of. We were talking about the God we know. And we weren't teaching you things we learned in a school about God. We were talking about things that happened with God in our lives. That's the story we brought to you. But look where he's going with this. He says, so when we came, we were there. I was there. You don't get more firsthand than me, says Peter. I was there when the heavens opened and the voice came down and said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. But... We have, he says, so we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. But know this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. He's talking about the reliability of God's Word to us, the Scriptures. He's telling us that the Scriptures can be trusted, and he's saying, listen, as much as you like my eyewitness testimony, the Scriptures are more reliable than my eyewitness testimony is because eyes can be deceived people thought they knew what was going on and been wrong but the scripture doesn't lie this tells the truth and you've got this and so when he says those who've received a faith of the same kind as ours he's talking to people who have believed the same promises we have and therefore are in the same category with us right You've joined us in this great believing experience. And he says, by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you. I love the word multiplied. It's so much better than added. You know, if, if, if you take two and you add two, you've got four. And if you add two, you've got six. And if you add two, you've got... Eight, but if you take two and you multiply by two, you've still got four. But if you t- multiply by two, you've got eight. And if you multiply by two, you've got 16. This is beginning to go up much quicker, isn't it? Yes. Multiply 16 by two, you've got 32. You multiply 32. My, my, it's, never mind. But I, I, one time I had to do the, the by twos, by fours, because uh, I couldn't believe how quickly it got out there. But it does. You're over 1,000 in no time flat. If you start just multiplying by four. (laughs) We. Grace and peace multiplied. I don't even need to ask. I'm suspecting most of you could use a little grace and peace added. How would you like to have some grace and peace multiplied to you? Well, that could change things. That could change a lot about how I feel about that meeting on Tuesday. That could change a lot about how I feel about going to work tomorrow. That could change a lot about a lot of things if I knew that I had grace and peace multiplied to me. And that's exactly what the prayer and the proclamation of the Spirit is here. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in what? In the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. Knowing something about who God is, knowing something about who Jesus is, understanding that these names carry with them the signification of their character, all that they are. That's what makes the name of Jesus powerful. It's not because it's magical. It's because it references all that Jesus is. Let me say that again. Name. That's why we talk about having a good name. (laughs) Having a good name. Like what? Tom? Fred? Larry, Mike, what's a good name? No, what do we mean by a good name? Well, your name is only good if your character is good, right? Because your name becomes the shorthand way of referencing everything you are. The name itself is insignificant. Other people share the name. I'm not the only John in the world. I know that comes as a shock to many of you. But I discovered as a boy that John is a remarkably common name that you can hardly go anywhere without encountering other people named John. And not all of them are people you want to be associated with. John is not a good name, but it is if it's attached to someone who has good character, which backs up that name. 
And when, when we're talking about the knowledge of God and of Jesus, we're not just talking about having some sense of who they are, but we're talking about knowing something about them which describes their character, what we mean when we say Father God, what we mean when we say Jesus Christ, what we mean when we say Holy Spirit. Those things, we need to increase in that knowledge. There is not a one of us who can say, I've got all the revelation I will ever need on that particular topic Thank you. Next. No. The farther we go, the more we know. And I tell you, the farther I go, the more I become aware of how much I don't know. It's funny. I I have a friend who used to say all the time, you should have talked to me years ago. I could have helped you then. I used to know everything. And it was, it was always funny when he said it, but there's a certain truth to that. I remember when I thought I almost knew it all. It, it felt like I had just grown so far in my understanding and my awareness of, of these things, and I thought, I've just, I'm, I'm this close to finishing the deal, and I don't know what we do after that. Then I know everything. Well, that was a long time ago. I've learned a lot since then, and I still don't know everything. Uh, apparently, I wasn't as close to the finish line as I thought I was, and... Nobody but me has ever thought they were right there, huh? But there's no end to this stuff. But increasing in that knowledge, as we grow in that knowledge, as we take possession of that knowledge, we create a way for grace and peace to be multiplied to us. And if you know that you need grace and peace multiplied to you, then you know that you have a need to grow in the knowledge of God and of our Savior Jesus Christ. And you know what you can do about it instead of just sitting still and hoping that grace and peace catch up with you. There's something we can be intentional about is growing. Now, he's, he's not done with his sentence here. He says, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. What a remarkable statement. What a full to overflowing statement. His divine power has granted, not will grant or is granting, has granted, it's a done deal, has granted to us everything. What doesn't fit into everything? Everything pertaining to life and to godliness. Whatever it is, whatever thing I think I need in order to experience more life and life more abundantly, whatever thing it is that I need to grow in my godliness. You say, what in the world is godliness anyways? Piety, uh, I think it's Barry's translation likes the word piety there. And it's like, well, that really helped a lot. (laughs) Some of you are thinking, I don't want either godliness or piety. They both sound kind of stuffy to me. Well... It's, it's a simple word. We take the word for reverence or awe to be moved in a, in a spiritual way by something, and we put the word for good on the front of it, so it means to be well reverence, or w- it means I'm doing it right. It means that I, I'm moved to an awestruck worshiping. And he says, listen, everything you need for life and for that kind of awed worship is granted to you in Christ Jesus. Absolutely everything. Everything that you need to get there. Everything that you need to live in that experience has been, has been granted to us. Is that good news? Yes. Where? Through the knowledge. Oh, man, i got to learn something again. Yes, we got to keep growing in knowledge. Not so that you get a big head or so that you can live in your head. You've lived in your head. It's not a happy place. Are you familiar with the fact that your happy place is not your head? And having spent so much of your life living in your head, you know it's not the place you want to be. So we're not talking about getting ourselves to where this all becomes an intellectual process. I just need knowledge, knowledge, knowledge so that I can out-argue people, so that I can go sit around seminaries and be belligerent. It's so that I can... It, it, the, the point is that I want the knowledge because it's taking me somewhere. It's doing something for me. It isn't just knowledge for knowledge's sake. It's knowledge which works. And it works to do what? It works to allow me to receive all things pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own 
glory, and excellence. For by these, by, by out of his glory and excellence, he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature. Now let's pause for a moment and look at that. His precious and magnificent promises is the way the New American Standard comes up with to say that. Uh, I think the King James says exceeding great and precious promises. It's really hard to translate this because it isn't really even good I say it isn't good English, it isn't even good Greek, it's kind of just a weird thing to say, but the point here is to get the point across. And he's using the superlative. What it, l- it literally says, the greatest precious promises, and it's like, well, that doesn't even make sense, comparing them to what? Greatest precious, because it's a superlative. They're great and precious, but they're the greatest preciousness. And it's like, well, preciousness is pretty great. How do you get greater than precious? And it's like, well... The point here is that like so many things with God, you run out of words to try to explain how far out there he is. His promises are so much better than I've got adjectives for that I find myself fumbling with superlatives trying to say the greatest, precious, most promises. Oh, man, they're awesome. You've got to see these things. (laughs) And that's the deal. These promises, these promises that he's made, these words that he's spoken, these things aren't just kind of interesting stuff that my mother writes on three-by-five cards and puts on the mirror. No, these things are exceeding and great, precious promises. These are magnificent. These things, this is where the power of God is coming to us in these promises. He's granting ability through these promises. And what does he specifically say here? We get through these precious and magnificent promises. We become partakers of his divine nature. We get to participate, partake, have a part in his divine nature. What? Yes, his divine nature. We get to have a part, participate in, not add to, not bring our part to. Forget your part. We don't want your part. It's not a, we're, not, we're not making a mix. His divine nature, your human nature, this is going to be awesome. No. But you get to participate in his divine nature. We were talking just moments ago about having a good name, having good character. Where are you going to get good character? I'll give you a hint. I know where good character resides. (laughs) At the throne of grace. If you could have a part of the nature of God himself who cannot lie, God himself who is never wrong, God himself who is merciful, God himself who has all wisdom and all truth, If you could have yourself a part of that nature, you might be on your way to good character. And he says, listen, I'm willing to share my divine nature. I'm willing to make that available to you. This is not something I'm planning to keep from you. Here's how we're going to do this. I'm going to give you magnificent and precious promises. You're going to believe them, and that's going to change things. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. The world around us is experiencing corruption. You don't have to be a very spiritual person to come to that conclusion. You don't have to ever open the Bible to come to that conclusion. There's a corruption that's in this world and its systems. The way that things operate out here, what seems to be standard operating procedure in the world around us, clearly has a corruption built into it. Nobody wants to disagree right now, right? (laughs) There's a corruption there. But this passage is telling me by God's Spirit that that corruption enters through lust. Now, we tend to use lust in a very narrow focus. We have something pretty specific in mind when we say that. But it actually describes all manner of inordinate, inordinate passion, desire which is too strong and always selfish. Let me say that again. It's desire which is too strong and always selfish. You know, the one that makes you knock over little children on your way to the cupcake table. <laughs> 
Most of us wouldn't call that lust, but it is. <laughs> Sorry, kid. You snooze, you lose. You know, it's, there, there's a moment where it's kind of like, Ugh. But pause for a moment. He says, the corruption we recognize, there's a corruption in this world and its systems, but he says it enters through lust. Too strongly desiring, too selfish an outcome. That's the whole attack in Genesis chapter 3. When, when Satan comes questioning God's word and, and speaking to Adam and Eve, what's he talking about? He's trying to get them thinking about them. What's good for them when they saw that it was good for food and pleasing to the eyes to be desired? By who? What makes something that God said is off limits to be desired? It got quiet again all of a sudden. Ouch. What's the whole picture there? It's a moving from, I'm so privileged that I get to live in God's garden. God, who made everything, made a garden for me. And told me I can have anything I want except that. How cool is this? Let's just celebrate him all day, every day. Woo! But then there's this snake, and he's saying, don't think about God, think about you. Think about what he's keeping from you. You know, he's God. He's got to have something he's holding back. I don't know. Did he tell you the whole story? He doesn't want you to be like him. Look at this. It's shiny. It's attractive. Doesn't this look delicious? Isn't this the color of food? And the whole process is about moving from I get to live in God's garden to what has God not given me that I deserve? It comes from an outward focus to an inward focus. It's about me. No, I'm not as happy as I should be. It's probably the fault of everybody around me. It's the people I live with, the boss that I work for. That's what's wrong here. I should be much more fulfilled than this, and these other people don't seem to recognize that. Are you guys there? It's just the selfishness. It's all about me. What do I need? What do I want? What would make me happy? That didn't do enough to make me happy. I need to be happier than that. Do I need more? Do I need something different? I don't know. The corruption enters this world through lust. There is a lust which comes with selfishness. And selfish desires will not be still. If we entertain selfish desires, they grow stronger and stronger. They become more and more impassioned and emblazed until they burn with lust. They want to be handled. And it gets to the point where you're so distracted that you can hardly do anything because you're so tired of nobody taking care of you. Are we home? That's, he says, listen, there is a deliverance from that. There is an escape from that. You don't just gradually work your way out of that. You run from that. You come clean from that. And he says that we escape the corruption that's in the world through lust by entering into his divine nature. By receiving his spirit and the fruit of his spirit in our lives, we enter into a life of love and joy, and peace, of self-control, of service, of where, where responsibility doesn't weigh heavily on us, but it's natural to us. I don't need a vacation for my responsibilities. I need a vacation from the stress of thinking I've got to handle them myself in my strength. There is no vacation from us. Hey, hello, did you know responsibility? I am responsible. I am responsible for my calling as a husband. I am responsible for my calling as a father. I am responsible for my calling as a grandfather. I am responsible for my calling as a pastor. I am responsible for my calling as a neighbor. i got all kinds of responsibilities. There's nowhere to go from that. When I'm at the beach with my toes in the sand, I'm still responsible. I didn't say I sit there sweating and stressing because I'm responsible, but I'm not off duty. It's not like five days a week I wear these responsibilities. Two days a week I'm my own man. It's... No, those responsibilities are with me everywhere all the time. The problem is I need to find a way to be steadfast and patient under them instead of 
looking for a way to escape from them. My father, who I'm growing up to be more and more like, is responsible all the time. He doesn't take any time off from being God. There's never a moment where he says, you know, this, this whole prayer thing, I, I know I said make your petitions known, but good night. Who knew you had so many? <laughs> Tell you what, next week, moratorium. No petitions. I need a break. It's never happened. There has never been a moment. He not only is handling all of the serious stuff, like keeping the planets in their orbits, he's handling all of the small stuff, like caring for me and considering whether I've eaten and whether I'm clothed. All of that's on his mind without me having to ask him for it to be because he handles that. You say, wow, that's amazing. Yeah, and if we've got his spirit in us, if we're strengthened with might in our innermost being by his Holy Spirit, then we're going to be people who have that same kind of life and strength in us. And the weight of being me isn't supposed to wear me out. I need some breaks. I need a Sabbath. I need some times of rest for sure, but I don't need to be released from responsibility. I don't need to be released from the burden of being me. I need to find a way to be me that isn't burdensome. And if being you is really burdensome, I'm going to suggest you're being the wrong you. <laughs> Let me just say that again. If being you is really burdensome, I'm going to suggest you're being the wrong you. The you you were made to be wasn't supposed to wear you out. It's a joy to be who you are in Christ. It's a joy to be who you were made to be. It's a joy to serve in the ways that you were made to serve. It's a joy to respond responsibly in the things you were made to. Yeah, there's things you carry that you're not supposed to carry that wear you down. That's true, of course. If you're going to mess with that stuff, it's always going to feel awkward. You're running in somebody else's armor, but in yours, you will be now, I'm not saying you never have a moment where you're tempted to weariness, but it's a whole different kind of situation. And a great deal of the weariness and stress that's reported in the world around us is from simply trying to be the wrong me. He says he's granted us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become a partaker of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. There is an escape from the corruption which enters this world through lust, impassioned selfishness. Impassioned selfishness. And as that continues to exist in the lives of men and women, it continues to corrupt this world and its systems. But we can receive a deliverance. We can escape out of that corruption. Is that helping? Yeah. Now, wh what he enters into here is a kind of a, a series of things. You could spend a long time studying, and uh, it's not our purpose this morning to do that. There have been other times when perhaps I have done that, if, if it interests you, or you can study some on your own. But let's just read through this a little bit and come towards the conclusion. So he says, now for this very reason also. What very reason? Because he's granted us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world by lust. For this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's pause on verse 8 for a moment. These things, he says, if these things and others like them are in you and are increasing, this is their potency. This is the promise associated with them. They will make you neither useless nor unfruitful. Is there anybody here who would like to be useless? You say, that's my goal every day. I want to be incompetent, useless. 
My plan is to be useless. Is there anybody who says to themselves, I want to be unfruitful? You know, the problem with me is that I bear too much fruit. I think a barren season would be really good along about now. That's my prayer request today. No, is anybody? I don't think so. No, there's not a one of us who is interested in becoming useless or unfruitful, and we just encountered a way to not be useless or unfruitful, to find these qualities in you and increasing. In other words, if I apply myself to being intentional about growing and maturing, if I am taking inventory from time to time to make sure these qualities are in me and that they're not just static but that they're increasing, that I'm not satisfied with last week's godliness, but that I'm growing in my reverential awe, my well-reverencing Him. That I'm not just satisfied with last week's self-control, but that I am more and more and more taking possession of this vessel and saying, I live in here, I'm going to control how this thing behaves. If these things are increasing, then he says, you just made sure you're not going to be useless, you're not going to be unfruitful. There may be things we could do to make you more useful or more fruitful, but you just made sure you won't be useless or unfruitful. Is that good news for anybody besides me? And he says it specifically in what? In the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. As we come into this full, complete, experiential knowledge of Jesus, he says it isn't going to be for nothing. It isn't going to be just so that we'll be good at arguing about Jesus. So that we can correct other people's theology. You know the theology police? That statement you made right there, that's obviously a second century heresy. (laughs) Here we go. Actually, I just used the wrong verb tense. Give me a break. I didn't even say what I meant to say, but I do that sometimes. Nobody, huh? If we're going to grow in the knowledge, if we're going to receive the true knowledge of Jesus, if we're going to get this complete, real knowledge of Jesus, let's find it useful and fruitful. Let's do something with it which makes a difference. So he says, For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. So here we go. There's two categories that are available to me. I can be growing or I can be blind and short-sighted. How about if I'm just wise and on pause? Uh, I didn't see that category. Did you see that category? Wise and on pause. That's me. No, you're either growing or you're being blind and short-sighted. Well, I don't really like admitting to being blind and short-sighted, but I've had an awful lot of plateaus where blind and short-sighted ends up ultimately being what you'd have to call it in hindsight, yes. At the time, if you'd have called me blind and short-sighted, I might have popped you one, but... (laughs) In hindsight, yes, okay, guilty as charged. Yes, we forget things, don't we? We forget things. We lose focus. We quit prioritizing. We don't pay attention to. We don't allow ourselves and our decisions to be controlled by and things we do know but we don't hold in the, in the forefront of our thoughts. And we let go of those things. And he says, listen, that's exactly what it means. If I'm not moving forward in these things, if I'm not bringing forward these things, then I'm choosing to be blind and short-sighted forgetting what my purification did for me, forgetting where I came from and what I was before God got involved here. I'm beginning to think on some level that I've always been this cool and deserved this. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about His calling and choosing you, for as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble And in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. The entrance will be abundantly supplied to me. The way I like to think about that is that it's a wide entrance for me. I need wide entrances. Narrow doors are a problem to me. You wouldn't think, I am not that wide as people go. 
I mean, I have seen a lot of people wider than me in this world, and yet somehow or another, the amount of clothing that I have damaged on the sides of doors. I just ruined a pair of pants a few weeks ago, again, the same way. I was moving through, and I hooked the pocket. I guess I, I, what I did was I started through, and then I started back, and on the way back, I hooked the pocket on the latch on the thing, and I, <laughs> oh, man, again. You know, the door's three feet wide. Aim for the middle, boy. But somehow or another, I have this challenge. I hit the inside corner when I'm walking through things. I need wide doors. Wide doors are very good with me. I really like wide doors. Wide doors, double doors that open, say, come on in. This is a, very, this is a big positive in my world where I have no chance of hitting the edge because I'm nowhere near the edge because I get soiled off a dirty hinge, get ripped, on a door latch, you get dinged this way or that. It happens way more often than I really am pleased to admit th that I have this experience. And I it keeps coming down that way. Wide door is a good thing. He says, listen, I give you a wide target, something for you to aim for here. If we're diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing, which is simply to say, that I respond to it every day, that I pay attention to it every day. Not that I'm, I'm wondering if he really did call and choose me, but that I'm working like I want. You know, if every day I went to work, I worked as though I wanted to be hired for the job, I'd be a better employee. If I treated every day like it was an interview, like somebody's watching me to see whether they want me to come do this job again tomorrow. It would change things. And that's essentially what we're talking about here. Act as though we want him to call and choose us, as though we want to be certain that he's called and chosen us. Pursue that with a diligence every day in a way that says, I respect this, I care about this, I prioritize this. Your calling and choosing me is important, and I don't just say it's important, Lord, and then go about my own day my own way, but I make it the top priority of my day, being your guy, doing what you've given me to do. He says that, that opens the door so that you find a wide entrance, so that you don't bang yourself on the way in. Is that good news? Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Grace and peace be multiplied to you. It's a prayer we can live with, isn't it? Let's stand up together, if you will. In the 10th chapter of the book of Romans, it says to us at the 9th and the 10th verses that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen? There's, there's something here that speaks to me that calling on the name of the Lord is the way to be saved. That believing is the way to not be disappointed, rejected, and turned away. He tells me that when believing is taking place, that I have an opportunity to call on the name of the Lord. And that in that calling, there is a rescue, which I want to partake of. And for a long time, I struggled with how that's accomplished. And then somebody essentially told me what these verses say, and it just became clear all of a sudden. I realized that the next move was mine and that I needed to say something. And I did. And I'm, I'm going to make that declaration again this morning. I'm going to declare that I believe and that Jesus is Christ and Lord. And if you'd like to, you can join me and we can pray this way together. Dear God, thank you. In Jesus' name, for hearing me today. I do believe in my heart that you've raised Jesus 
up from the dead. I proclaim with my mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord. I thank you, Father, for this new life, for your strength leading me in the paths of righteousness for your name's sake. In Jesus' name, amen.